become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Brian Watt. I am the morning news anchor at KQED Radio, and it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Boykin, political commentator and author of Race Against Time, The Politics of a Darkening America. Keith is an award-winning author. He teaches at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia University. He served as an aide in the White House to President Bill Clinton, he is the co-founder and first board president of the National Black Justice Coalition. In Race Against Time, Keith tackles the complex issues of racism, sexism, xenophobia, and homophobia at a time when our country is more politically divided than ever. And he weaves his own story and research into American political history that he brings. We have a lot to talk about in the next hour, and we want your participation. So let me ask you or remind you now to submit any questions for Keith in the text chat on YouTube. Really want to get those questions. Let me, first of all, welcome you again. Keith Boykin, welcome. Hi, good, good, day, good morning, good afternoon, Brian. I <laughs> good day. what time it was. <laughs> well, uh, bottom line is it's... Um, election day in California, uh, lots of people going to the polls, and it's great to be having a political discussion. Um, I want to get right into this book. Um, the first thing that really grabbed me at the beginning of this book is your compelling retelling of the year 2020 with the first six days of 2021 tacked on for good measure. We all knew it was hard, and I think we're still recovering from it, but you write about it as a collision of four tectonic plates, all having to do with race in America. What are those plates? Well, thank you for asking that, Brian. And, you know, I think it's going to take us some time, maybe years or decades before we all put together what happened in 2020 from historical perspective and analyze it. Kind of the way I look back at the year 1968 as this sort of cataclysmic year in American history when, when uh, not only Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, but also uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. We had this Democratic Convention in Chicago with so much chaos and, and ultimately led to the election of Richard Nixon. It just seemed like a, it just seemed one of those years that you couldn't imagine possibly being alive and living through all this. Uh, and I felt like 2020 was a year like that. I think we will look back in time and, and think about it that way. So we have these four tectonic plates that you mentioned. The first, of course, everyone knows about was the COVID epidemic, the coronavirus pandemic that started at the beginning of March uh, in 2020. And this was an enormously disruptive influence in, in our not only our country's uh, life, but the life of the world, the planet. Uh, that was immediately, of course, followed by the economic uh, crisis, the crisis that caused tens of millions of people to lose their jobs, to be laid off of work because they couldn't go to work because of the pandemic. And then just as that started to let up a bit in May, we began the racial justice crisis, which was almost two years ago today uh, when George Floyd was, uh, was murdered in Minneapolis and protests erupted around the country, the largest civil rights demonstration we'd had in this country since the 1960s. Uh, and all of that ultimately led to the fourth tectonic plate, the fourth crisis, which was the crisis of democracy, which started immediately afterwards. First, when Donald Trump uh, ordered his forces to, to fire tear gas on peaceful protesters outside the White House, uh, leading up to his failure to recognize his or accept his defeat in the election. And ultimately, as you mentioned, six days after the end of the year with the insurrection at the United States Capitol. All four of those things had to do with race, obviously, uh, not obviously for all of them. The racial justice crisis is obvious to people. But the coronavirus pandemic was also very much related to race. And we saw this from the beginning uh, with the racial disparities and who was impacted by this. I'm from the city of St. Louis, Missouri. In the first month and a half of the, of the pandemic, every single person who died uh, from COVID was African-American in the city of St. Louis. Mm. Every single one of them in a city that is not a majority black city. 
Uh, even the economic crisis, black people were more likely to be uh, hit by that, more likely to be unemployed. We had a higher unemployment rate uh, during COVID, much higher. And when we did have to go to work, we were often forced to work in those jobs that were most likely to be in the front line, most likely to be uh, exposed to COVID. So there was a racial component to that. And finally, the crisis of democracy was entirely about race. I mean, this started because of the George Floyd protest, of course. Uh, it continued when the president invited the people, the St. Louis couple, uh, the McCloskeys, who, who waved their, their guns at the Black Lives Matter protesters in, in, in front of their home in, in Missouri in uh, August of 20, uh, 2020. And after the election, the places that Donald Trump chose to target because of his campaign obsession with pretending that he didn't lose the election were places where black voters were, 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 were based. He went to Atlanta, Georgia. He went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He went to Detroit, Michigan, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, just places where black people were disproportionately located and challenged the votes in those cities, in those counties and areas around those cities, but not in the rest of those states, which were overwhelmingly different from, from that. So he wasn't concerned about the vote tally in Georgia overall, except for getting those votes that he needed. But he wanted to challenge the votes in Fulton County because he felt that there, where the black people were voting, there had to be some, some problem with the vote. Or in Philadelphia, there, where the black people were voting, there had to be some problem with the vote. Race has been at the core of the country's problem since the beginning of our nation's founding. And in 2020, it all started to unravel. What I thought was really gripping was the way you presented George Floyd himself as that body in which all of those crises met. This, uh, you know, tell me about that. Well, I didn't know this at first. It took some research to, until I figured it out as I was digging into the story of George Floyd. And I discovered in some ways he did reflect all of those different elements. First of all, the COVID crisis, he had COVID himself uh, shortly before uh, he was murdered. Uh, he lost his job uh, in the pandemic, um, uh, and he was unable to, to work in the regular job he had, which obviously had an impact on what would happen to him in the future. He was clearly the epitome of the racial justice crisis itself because he was, uh, he was arrested and, and murdered in Minneapolis, which, which initiated the whole uh, protest movement. And lastly, it was his death that facilitated the, the crisis of democracy that, that encourage people to go out into the streets and protest, but also encourage this whole sort of anti-protester uh, movement in the country, this whole sort of mentality that, uh, that this Donald Trump, I think, said at that time, um, something along the lines of, uh, we, if people go out into the streets, we're, gonna, we're essentially going to take them out. And um, it, it's a sad, sad state of affairs that all that had to be embodied in one human being, and that one human being's name, George Floyd, has become sort of a marker of that year of 2020. Mm. I was gripped by that because I knew the basics about George Floyd, but I didn't know he had COVID. I didn't know he had lost the job. There were all these things that you realize in that moment, it, you know, that's why he is kind of the face of it. Since you mentioned those protests, you yourself were arrested. Um, during those protests, but you weren't protesting, if I'm reading your book correctly. You were working. That's correct. I was uh, actually working as a journalist to cover one of the protests that took place in New York City. It started in Harlem and moved out into the West Side Highway in Manhattan. And um, I was covering it, watching the protesters and the inevitable clash that was about to happen with the police. Um, and as the police were approaching from the south and the marchers were moving from the north, I stood in the middle, well, on the side of the road in the middle to, to document it all. Uh, and as I'd been doing all day and the police came and, uh, and they told me uh, what they were doing. And I said, I'm with the press. And they said, it, and they, at first they did nothing. They walked by me, but then they turned around and then they uh, approached me and they arrested me without any warning. And I said, again, I'm with the press. And they said, it doesn't matter you're going to jail. So they put me in these zip ties, um, the, the sort of nylon tactical restraints. They put me, they, they turned me around backwards. They lifted me up and marched me uh, all, all the way down to a police van, held me in this police van for a few hours, and then in a police bus, un air conditioned police bus for a few hours and put me in jail. 
um, for, for several more hours, um, all because I was simply covering a protest and never gave me an opportunity to, 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 to do anything about it. So um, it's a reflection, I think, of just how we criminalize uh, dissent in our country, but also how we don't allow those of us who are in the media to do the job of, pr of, protect, of presenting to the public what's actually taking place in the streets. Uh, and so in this particular incident, um, it was very troubling to me because it happened the day after one of my CNN colleagues, Omar Jimenez, had been arrested live on the air while reporting in Minneapolis at a George Floyd protest. Yeah. Uh, and the irony of that story was that uh, Omar is black and one of our other colleagues, Josh Campbell, who's white, was reporting at the same exact protest and he was not arrested. Mm -hmm. You kind of came to a realization in that moment um, or, or right after it that I thought was really interesting to read about in the book. And there are actually all kinds of passages in, in your book that I would love to hear you read, but I had to pick one. Uh, you make that really hard. <laughs> but this, this passage right here on page 34, right after you got arrested, um, I, I just thought it would be nice if, if you could read this passage of sort of the realization that you got to after being arrested and released. Absolutely, Brian. Um, I'll read this right now. When I passed another group of protesters in the streets on my way home, I stopped for a few moments, minutes to watch their confrontation with the police from a safe distance. But I knew I could not remain and cover it. I had very little battery charge left on my phone and even less in my soul. After just being released from jail, I was tired and hungry and did not want to risk going back. I felt like a fugitive, and maybe that was the point. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions, the historian Carter G. Woodson once warned. He was right. They had successfully controlled my thoughts that night, and I was too defeated to continue fighting. It soon occurred to me that this was precisely the point. This was exactly why white America had historically and repeatedly chosen to respond to black outrage as a criminal justice issue rather than a social justice concern. Instead of addressing our needs, the nation had always responded by policing and criminalizing our conduct. And by doing so, they could try to make us feel like criminals just for existing, just for demanding our dignity. It had not always, it had been this way since the founding of the Republic. Whenever a threatening moment of black empowerment arose, white backlash followed. The pattern repeated itself during abolitionism and reconstruction in the 19th century to the demonstrations of the civil rights movement in the 20th century and the election of a black president in the 21st century. Since that historic election, the existential threat to white patriarchal hegemony has only grown stronger. White Christians, who accounted for eight out of 10 Americans at the nation's bicentennial, have now become a minority in this country. White birth rates have declined. Non-white immigrant communities have swelled. The, the population of native Spanish speakers has quadrupled in four decades. The Asian American population has grown more rapidly than any other demographic group in the nation. And gays and lesbians have won the freedom to marry in all 50 states. So that was uh, sort of my coming to terms with what was happening with my arrest and also sort of trying to contextualize it into the larger forces that were going on in our society. I, I feel like our, ch our country is at a, a critical crossroads, which is the reason why I wrote this book, mm -hmm. that um, all these changes are taking place and they're frightening to a lot of people. We've had now a black president for eight years. We've had a black woman vice president for a few years. We will soon have a black woman on the Supreme Court for the first time in history. Uh, we have a woman, a white woman who ran for president and got more votes than the white man who, quote unquote, defeated her when, when she ran. Uh, we also have uh, in the in five states uh, in the West, the Hispanic population will soon be the majority in the next three decades. 
the Asian American population growing rapidly, marriage equality in all 50 states, um, the, the trans community becoming more openly accepted and embraced, and all those things are causing a backlash. And so we're seeing a resistance to that. We're seeing opposition to trans, to trans uh, inclusion in high schools. We're seeing uh, opposition to critical race theory, which isn't even being taught in schools, but the argument being suggested that it is. We're seeing opposition to the idea of teaching black history in schools. Uh, we're seeing the, which by the way is American history. Uh, we're, all, we're also seeing um, people going after um, venerated companies like Disney just for simply mentioning the word gay uh, or for, for, for having the courage to challenge people who don't want them to say gay. Uh, we're seeing a challenge to a resistance to a backlash to all of the forces that are making America that have made America a modern society. And it's an effort in some ways to take our country back. Uh, so when you hear the phrase, when I heard the phrase, as a lot of Black people did, make America great again, a lot of us thought, well, when exactly do they want to make America like what year in the past? Apparently, that presupposes there was some time in the past when America was better than it is now. And at every point in our past, our country was still struggling with issues of inclusion for people of color, for black people, for Native Americans, indigenous people, for, for women and other groups of people. So why would we want to go back to that time as opposed to creating a, fu a future where our country is much more inclusive, more pluralistic, and more welcoming and embracing? Mm. You, you note, as others have noted, that uh, people liked to call what happened in 2020 a reckoning, but you don't like the term reckoning. In your book, you don't think it's an appropriate term that, in fact, the reckoning is not complete. What, why don't you like this term? Well, because I feel like we go through these periods repeatedly in our history, in our country, we go through these cycles of crises. Uh, we had it in, from the beginning, the founding of the Republic. We had it in the Civil War. We had it uh, during the, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, we had it even after Rodney King uh, was beaten here in Los Angeles. We, we've had these moments where Americans sort of wake up and realize that race is a big issue. Racism and white supremacy are issues we need to address. And then we talk about it for a few weeks, maybe even a few months, and then we never do anything. And that's exactly what happened in the case, uh, again, uh, with 2020. People were talking about it as though we were reckoning, but there was no substantive change that was, that was connected to that. There were just people who were talking about it. Uh, there were no laws passed, that, no real federal laws to pass that changed anything. And in fact, um, even in the time since 2020 uh, ended, there have been Black people, as well as other social justice advocates, uh, pushing for three or four specific types of reform. One is police reform. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act still can't get passed in the Senate. It's still stuck. Um, another is voting reform. Uh, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act still can't get passed in the Senate. It's stuck. Um, the one piece of legislation that did get passed, and this has taken, by the way, more than 100 years to do, is the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. Mm. Uh, but, you know, people have been fighting to, to outlaw lynching as a federal crime in the United States for, for a century. And it, it, we just now were able to do that in the past year. But that is the least that we should expect our government to be able to do in response to the, the, the ongoing racial injustice that we see in America. We actually got a question early from someone watching and listening um, that comes right out of this. I mean, we're, we are in the first uh, sort of national election cycle since 2020. Um, primaries going on in California today where I am. Um, as we head into these midterms, what are you watching for and what are you concerned about? Yeah, I, I am here in Los Angeles and we have a we have an election here, obviously, for mayor of Los Angeles and elections, elections going on in the state of California and other states as well. Um, and the midterms are coming up in November. Uh, there's some interesting races to watch. Uh, of course, the Pennsylvania Senate race is an interesting race with uh, Mehmet Oz, uh, the Republican candidate, going against John Fetterman. Uh, and the Georgia Senate race is another one that people are watching because Herschel Walker, who's a 
black Republican who doesn't even live in the state of Georgia, who was recruited to, 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 to run for Senate from the state of Texas, is running against the incumbent Democratic senator who's also black, Raphael Warnock. Um, and I think one of the things I'm looking for um, in that race and some of the other races is what is this sort of cynical approach that Republicans have taken to identity politics is going to be effective for them. And by this, I mean, there's been a critique for quite some time uh, from people on the right who say that Democrats and liberals and progressives are only focused on identity politics. But this is exactly what Republicans have been doing for decades in a different way. Um, I mentioned in my book, um, when Hillary Clinton became popular in, in 2008, uh, John McCain then chose Sarah Palin to be his running mate who had no qualifications to be vice president of the United States, but because Hillary Clinton was a woman, they picked a woman. Uh, when Barack Obama ran for, pre ran for Senate back in uh, 2004, uh, Republicans realized he was doing well and their, their primary candidate dropped out. So they chose Alan Keyes, a, a black Republican conservative who didn't even live in the state, had no connection to no elected officer experience. They chose him simply because he was black to be to be uh, the, the candidate to go against Barack Obama. Uh, when Thurgood Marshall uh, left the Supreme Court, Republican President George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush chose Clarence Thomas to be his replacement, not because he was the most qualified person in the Supreme Court uh, to be on the Supreme Court, but because he was black. And George H.W. Bush even said at that time that he was the most qualified person to be on the court. And no one believed that. Mm. When, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg, this, this titan in women's law, who, in the law in our country as a, as a woman and a feminist, who, who, who advocated and, and fought in the Supreme Court in some of the most important cases going back to the 1970s, when she died and passed away and, and uh, had to be replaced in the Supreme Court, Republicans swiftly pushed another woman candidate, Amy Coney Barrett, who didn't have any of the experience that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg did. Uh, and yet when, when we have someone else like um, Katanji Brown Jackson, who's nominated, they suggest that that person doesn't qualify. So what does this all have to do with this, with the with midterms? It means that there is an effort up front to try to confuse voters. Uh, to try to pick people who uh, who are representative of various identities, but don't have those in, the interests of those identities communities in, at, at stake or in mind at all. So they pick somebody like a Herschel Walker because they think well, maybe even if he doesn't get that many black votes, he will at least allow white voters to feel comfortable about voting for a Republican, and they can say they're not racist even because they're not voting for the, the black person who's currently currently in, in the Senate, and also because it may possibly confuse just enough black voters or discourage and suppress just enough black voters so they don't turn out to vote. I mean, part of the strategy here with a lot of this, and the reason why we have a lot of the voter ID laws and the voter restriction laws that have been put in place in the past few years since the 2020 election, is, to, is designed specifically to suppress the vote, to suppress the vote of particular communities, the black and brown communities, especially of BIPOC communities, in large part because those are groups that vote overwhelmingly Democratic. The, the fascinating thing about our country's history is that a lot of people have said, well, you know, we gave you Obama. What else do you want? You know, we, like that's that should be reparations. America has moved on. We've had we've had progress. And you can't deny, of course, the importance of Barack Obama's presidency. But one person does not overcome 200 years of, of officials, uh, racism, and white supremacy in our country's history. And the more important point is that the majority of white people didn't even vote for Barack Obama in either of his two elections. But the majority of white people did vote for Donald Trump in both of his elections. The sad reality is that no Democratic candidate for president, not one, no single Democratic candidate for president has won the white vote since Lyndon Johnson, the Democrat, signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, your ability to find the patterns in history, you know, is truly astounding in this book and even just now here in this conversation. And as I read through your book for all that you were able to document, and, and we'll talk about some of those episodes in our electoral history as we keep going, I just wondered if anything shocks you anymore. Mm. Like when you find out that Herschel Walker has 
is has been drafted to Georgia from Texas to run against Raphael Warnock. Does that shock you? Did any of the things that Donald Trump did in 2020 shock you, surprise you, think that, hey, this is it? Like this is this has got to be what sort of shatters everything. Honestly, I think um, the, the only thing that shocked me recently is really the response to the insurrection. Hmm. I did think that after the insurrection, that there might be a moment here where we could have some sort of accountability, not for the whole history of, of racial injustice in our country, but accountability at least for the people who tried to overthrow the United States government. Right, right. And, and, and a lot of people in both parties were saying that they wanted that accountability. But here we are now um, in 2022, some two years, a year, late, a year and a half later, and um, it's been nothing but backpedaling. The same people who were even holding Donald Trump accountable, people like Mitch McConnell, refuse to do so anymore. Um, and as the January 6th committee prepares to hold public hearings in prime time this, this week on Thursday, every single network is planning to cover that. Um, every single news network, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, except Fox News. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> it, 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 it's almost, it, it's not even almost, it's, 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 it's as if they purposely want to keep their viewers angry and ignorant. And it's a sad state of affairs. I think this is what, this is the thing to answer your question more broadly uh, about what shocks me is that we've reached the point where nothing is shocking. Um, and Donald Trump said at some point he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and, and his support, he wouldn't lose any supporters, he probably gain some supporters. Look at what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, or uh, George Zimmerman. And um, I, I think it's a sad state of affairs that, that we don't even have that, that, the ability to be shocked anymore. We've we've passed that boundary. The one thing, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been a Democrat my entire life. I've been critical of the Democratic Party, never been a Republican. Um, and I actually mentioned in the book, honestly, that I encourage Black people to join the Republican Party to see so they could change it. But shortly after the book came out last October, I, I did a, a podcast interview with, with Michael Steele, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, who is Black himself. And he told me that I was wasting my time trying to encourage black people to join the Republican Party because it was too late to change. That is that's that's the former chairman of the Republican National Committee telling me this. So that's not a that's not a healthy sign for our democracy. The thing that's so so dangerous to me about Trump and, and where we are now is that of all the presidents we've had in my lifetime and, in, and of all the presidents I'm aware of in American history, I've never known a president who was so callously unconcerned and cavalierly unworried about the, the state of the union. He seemed to not even care if the union was dissolved, it fell apart, if we had a civil war. He almost encouraged it, if you will, uh, in the sense of telling people to, to march in the Capitol to, to stop the, the, the peaceful transfer of power. I've never seen that before from any president in our history. I didn't like Ronald Reagan, but he never did that. I didn't like George W. Bush, but he never did that. Right. No, I, I, I also had these feelings. I sort of wondered exactly where the line was. Um, we've gotten another question um, from an audience member. Um, you describe us being in a window of opportunity for change to create a more equal country. What can be done to carry that energy into actual change? I'm glad you asked that question because I, sometimes I, I, I don't want people to think that it's all hopeless. <laughs> uh, uh, now I, I, have, I have actually changed some of my uh, ideas about things since the book was published in September, believe it or not, because it's only a short time. But I, I do feel like in some ways things have gotten worse. But I don't feel like it's over. I don't feel like that we have to quit or we should give up. If we did, then there's no point in, in fighting at all. Um, but I think I go back to something that Dr. King used to say. He wrote this in his letter from Birmingham jail uh, back in the 1960s, 1963. He said that um, we have to give up this notion that time 
will heal all wounds. Uh, we have to give up this tragic misconception of time, he said. Uh, and he, under, he said that we have to understand that time can be used either constructively or destructively. And time itself is neutral. So I, I think it's important for us to understand this, that we can't sit back and assume that change in America, a change in the world will cause all these problems to, dissolve, to solve themselves. That all, all the racism, homophobia, and sexism, misogyny, xenophobia, all that's just going to disappear when all the older people die off and the new young people take over. That's just not likely to happen. It's never happened in our society, in fact. And if you look at the people who are the 18-year-old who shot up the, the, the supermarket in Buffalo, um, we, st we still know that, that a lot of young people hold some of the same ideas as their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. Um, and if you look at the election results, 71 million people, or was it 74 million people voted for Donald Trump? Uh, in 2020, even after the four years of chaos we've seen. So I don't see any evidence that things are going to get better on their own. But what gives me hope is that there are people out there who are committed to, to fighting to make sure we do have a more loving, inclusive, embracing society. It's so easy to get people to support you if you, if you say things to, to divide. People are easily drawn to fear. It's that person's problem, or this person is the cause of your of the reason why you don't have a job, or that group, or this group. Um, and people respond to that historically, not not only in our country, but in every country in, in the history of the planet that I'm aware of. But it's harder to get people to 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 uh, to to go back to what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Uh, and I think that's who we have to who we have to be. We have to find those better angels. We have to appeal to that. We have to stand up and be engaged uh, and and understand that all that is necessary for evil to prevail. I think Edmund Burke was the one who said that. All that is necessary for evil to prevail is that good people do nothing. Given how easy it is to use fear and division, you know, to keep your fire burning and your star rising, do you? Are you surprised that uh, Donald Trump remains a big political player in the Republican Party? And, and this is this is actually a question, another question from an audience member. And and do you think that the Republican Party will ever return to its original ideals? And I know you say a lot in your book about what the original ideals of the original Republican Party were. So, well. Um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all. Donald Trump has become has st still has influence in the Republican Party, uh, although some of the influence is starting to wane. I guess we could say, based on the results in recent elections we've seen this year, um, that some of his candidates aren't doing quite as well. He was he was supporting uh, David Perdue against Brian Kemp in Georgia for the governor's race. He lost in that race big time, I think, by 50 points. Other races where he supported candidates that haven't won. Um, but, you know, he also supported Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, who has no credibility to be a United States senator and lives in New Jersey. But um, Trump supported him and he's barely eked out a victory in the primary. So he'll be going up against John Fetterman in the, in the, in the general election. Um, so the reason why I'm not surprised is because Donald Trump isn't the cause of the problems in the Republican Party. He was just the the most recent iteration of that this has been going on since the 1960s since uh barry goldwater who was a 64 republican presidential nominee voted against the civil rights act mm -hmm. black people my great great grandfather was a was a black republican who was a, a part of the uh who was the chair of the florida state republican convention in 1912 um and almost every black person who was alive at that time what in America was 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 a part of the Republican Party because the Democratic Party had a history of racism and the, the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. But that that party has has disappeared it, ever since the 1960s when the Republicans realized that they could win without appealing to black voters. When when um, Dwight Eisenhower ran for president, he got 40 percent of the black vote. 40% of the black folk. Right. Uh, today, you can't imagine any Republican getting 40% of the black folk in any, in any kind of presidential election. Well, so where does the Republican Party go from here? Does it just become more Trump or does it find a way? Like when you think about sort of the future of this political system that we have. I don't think it becomes more Trump. I think it outgrows Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it becomes more Trump 
Trumpian. I mean, Trump, Trump's influence in the Republican Party is undeniable. So we have people like Ron DeSantis now, who's probably the leading Republican candidate for 2024 for president, uh, who's currently the governor of Florida. And Ron DeSantis has been the, the primary uh, warrior, if you will, or general in the culture wars. Um, he, he's been leading the fight against masks, leading the fight against COVID ordinances, leading, leading the fight against Disney, leading the fight against LGBTQ people, leading the fight against uh, critical race theory. Um, all those things are great for him, for Republicans in the primary. And other Republicans are going to have to catch up to him. So we've got Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and other Republicans who are trying to be out, out, not even out Trump, but out DeSantis, DeSantis. Uh, and you've got Greg Abbott in, in Texas and Kim Paxson and, and others. Um, and so I don't see how this gets any better. I don't see how the Republican Party changes after this. I think what's likely to happen is that more people who find themselves uh, aligned with the, the sort of racial uh, racial politics of the Republican Party, the culture wars of the Republican Party will continue to cling to that. There's always going to be a space for that in America, no matter how much we progress. There's always be a space for that. It's just it hasn't always been a majority space. Uh, and now we're at the point where that space, even though it may not constitute a majority in terms of the public or majority in terms of public opinion, it's certainly a majority in terms of, of the governing in the various states in our country because of our, of our system of government. And that's ultimately the thing that this is the harder conversation to have. If we want to create fundamental change, we're going to have to change our system of government in some important ways. Um, we now have a, a president that isn't elected by the popular vote. Um, and so we've had that happen twice in my lifetime recently with George Bush and, and Donald Trump. We have um, a United States Senate, which is unrepresentative of the, the public at large. So we have so those of us like you and I who are in the state of California with 39 million people, we only get two U.S. senators, whereas North Dakota and South Dakota with only one and a half million people combined, they have four U.S. senators. That's the, the, this, this completely anti-democratic. And the Constitution makes it impossible to change that. Because Article Five of the Constitution says you can't diminish the number of senators any state has, any state has without its consent, um, and then we have a House of Representatives that's completely gerrymandered, so that even though Democrats are more more populous and 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 uh, more popular when win the votes, they don't they're not reflected in the majority in the in the in the, in the House of Representatives necessarily. Because in the, this upcoming election, we're going to see in, in a lot of states like Texas and, and other places where Democrats are being pushed out of districts uh, because of the Republican gerrymandering. Uh, and then we have a Supreme Court, the, the third branch of the three branches of government, where um, it's completely unaccountable. They can take away a woman's right to choose uh, something that's been uh, a precedent in our, in our country since Roe versus Wade in the 1970s. They can take away a woman's right to choose. Uh, and even though the majority of the American public support a woman's right to choose, even though women are the majority of the population. So we have a very anti-democratic system of government. I think the first step is people have to be aware and educated of just how, how undemocratic our system is in order to be able to reform or change it. But do Democrats or any party for that matter gain any traction, any popularity by trying to target these kinds of systemic things by trying to address everything, the Supreme Court, the, the way senators are elected, the, the electoral college, these, these kinds of things that like they're just really, really hard and they're, you know, third rails in one way, but they're also just not that sexy when you start trying to bring these up as a way to motivate voters. Yes and no. I agree with you that it, the, it, they're, it's not as sexy as saying this, this, man who you is who you're misgendering is causing all your problems in school because he is he's he's not really he's not really a woman um and, and he's competing in women's sports that's a that's an easier argument for 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 people to digest yeah why is why is this trans woman competing in sports 
uh, because they can relate to the sort of visceral prejudice with that. Or why are black, why are white kids being taught that that they are that they're there to be responsible for slavery? That that doesn't sound right. You know, we can you can gin up all these sort of arguments in the way that Fox News does, or Newsmax does, or Infowars does, or the Republican base does in general, um, with no basis in fact. You can just sort of throw these things out there, and people will resonate, will re will relate to that. At least a certain part of the population will relate to that. But if you say, you know, Citizens United is a, is a de detrimental decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that is corrupting our politics, <laughs> people don't pay attention to that. Um, if you say the Supreme Court is, has gutted the, vote, gutted the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County v. Holder, uh, and that makes it harder for the, the, the Justice Department to enforce the, the law, yeah. People don't really pay attention to that. So, yeah, I think we have to figure out a way to, to, to let people know effectively that all these issues matter. And I think there are some people who've, who've done that effectively. I think I've, I've never been a Bernie Sanders supporter, just to be perfectly blunt, blunt, blunt and honest about it. But I think he's been a very um, forceful and successful advocate for um, systemic change. Uh, at least in terms of economic policy, uh, he creates a very coherent message about why all these things are related. Elizabeth Warren does the same thing. Uh, I'm, I'm more supportive of her than I am Bernie Sanders, but, but I think they're both effective, uh, articulate spokespeople for, for uh, progressive policies that actually and understand the relation between all these sort of bigger forces and what's happening on the local level on, on a sort of... A, um, granular level. So, uh, and this is a, another question from an audience member that comes straight out of that. When you mentioned Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, what can Democratic leaders and politicians do to advance racial equity in our country? I will just add any kind of systemic political thing that like they've done a lot. You're, you're acknowledging that, but like, what could they do right now that kind of move some balls forward? Well, um, speaking of balls, for it feels like someone above me is uh, bouncing, bouncing a basketball or something. I don't know if you can hear that noise. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned before, one of the key pieces of legislation I'd like to see pass is the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Um, I'd like to see the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I'd like to see the For the People Act passed. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see reparations, um, the, the reparations bill, um, H.R. 40, um, um, get, uh, get some sort of traction in, in, in uh, not just the House, but in the Senate. I'd like to see a real conversation about these issues. And I think what happens with Democrats, and this has been going on for my entire career as a Democrat, going back to... I guess the Dukakis campaign in 1988, uh, when uh, I was working for Michael Dukakis, and I, he was running away from the word liberal. Um, I want Democrats to not be afraid of their own shadow. I want Democrats to start speaking about what they really believe in and not being so worried about how uh, Republicans will vilify them for saying that. I want Democrat. It reminds me of uh, I think it was who was it Howard Dean in two thousand four who said I come from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. Right. I want Democrats to be Democrats again. I remember when um, Franklin Roosevelt ran for re-election in nineteen thirty six, and uh, he gave an address on Halloween um, in New York City, I think, where he, he he mentioned all the people who were against him, the forces of of cap of the capitalist empire against me, and they are united in their opposition against me. And I welcome their hatred, he said. Yeah. Could you imagine Joe Biden or even Barack Obama or a Democrat today saying, I welcome the hatred of my opponents? I mean, I, 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 don't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't even conceive of that. But we think of uh, FDR as this great figure in American history, but he wasn't afraid to take on his enemies. Mm. You know, he was the one who tried to, quote, as they said, quote, unquote, pack the court. He wasn't afraid to push to try to, to advance the agenda that he believed in. I would like to see more of that from the Democrats in, in power, or, or Joe, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, whomever. I, instead of instead of negotiating against ourselves and saying, "Oh, we can't do this because you know people may not like us if we do this," I'd like to see them push to do those things they they, they say they really believe in, and then let somebody else tell them no. Mm -hmm. Uh, a quick pause from the political discussion for a more personal question from an audience member. What's the best piece of professional advice that you received and who was it from? 
a good question. The best. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to think about that. I can, I can tell you what I thought was probably the worst piece of professional advice I got. And then maybe that could give me some insight. Oh, yeah, bring it. Which is strange because I think I wrote about this in the book. But this came from Ron Brown, who I adored and respected in many ways. Um, he was the chair of the Democratic National Committee in the early 1990s. He was the first black cha- black chair of that of the of the DNC. Um, and I worked in his law firm. And I remember I had a meeting with him one time, and I was uh, in law school at that time. I was a, a summer associate, and I wanted to know what to do, and I wanted to go in politics. And and I wanted his advice because here he was, this lawyer, politician who was a, a, the head of the Democratic Party. What should I do? And he told me, don't go into politics. Go make some money. <laughs> go make some money. And um, politics will always be there. Hmm. And um, no, I understand the point he was making. I get that. Uh, uh, you know, there's a power behind money as well in our country, but it was not what I wanted to hear at all. And uh, so my advice, I think the best professional advice I, I've ever thought of is really advice I've gotten from myself. And and I actually, I won't even attribute to myself. I'll attribute to Whitney Houston. Hmm. All right. And it's not even her words because it's a song that she sings, but I, I can't remember who originally sang it, but uh, I think George Benson or someone, but, um, yeah, but in um, greatest love of all, she says, everybody's looking for a hero. I never found anyone to fulfill my dreams, a lonely place to be. And so I learned to depend on me. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'll, back to politics. Cause we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, We've talked a little bit about these congressional hearings of the January 6th committee, no matter who's televising it. Um, what are you looking for? What 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 are you what are you trying to see as we as we get this report and we start hearing, hearing, listening? I'm, I'm really interested in seeing some sense of a roadmap for accountability. Um, I, I'm assuming we're going to get some new information that we haven't heard before, or haven't seen before. I'm assuming the testimony will be compelling. I'm assuming that it will generate a significant amount of attention for at least a short period of time. Um, but then what happens afterwards? And that's what I'm looking for, um, a, a roadmap for what happens in terms of accountability. What, what is the outcome of pre- presenting this information? Um, we, we saw last week that Peter Navarro was indicted um, and arrested, um, but who else is going to be charged for their role in this conspiracy to overturn the government? W- will Donald Trump be involved in this? I mean, we know from the evidence that we've seen already that he was trying to get the Georgia officials, at least directly, to, to find votes for him, uh, just enough votes so he could win the election. Um, we know that he encouraged people to go to the Capitol on the day of the insurrection. Um, uh, we know that he was encouraging people to come to Washington, D.C. on January 6th in the first place. Um, and so I want to know what are we going to do to actually hold these people accountable? And this is actually this is this is actually part of a larger historical argument, too, because I think I wrote this, read about this in the book. Um, we have a history of not holding people accountable when they do things like this. This happened during the Civil War. And we just, President Andrew Johnson um, essentially decided that he was going to give amnesty to uh, all those people who fought uh, fought against us in in the Civil War. Um, And we still have people today flying the Confederate flag a flag of rebellion, a flag of traitors, a flag of racism and slavery. They're still flying the Confederate flag. Um, What does it say about our country that we haven't yet been able to resolve a a war, a civil war that took place more than 150 years ago? It means to me that we haven't dug deeply enough to, to, to sort of figure out what are the real issues in our country and how do we move forward from those? That's the reason why I would like to see something like what we saw in South Africa a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. They didn't just sort of sweep it under the rug after apartheid ended. They actually, they brought out all the evidence. They presented it for the public and the world to see. And then they held people accountable. Mm -hmm. Another audience member would like to know, what do you want readers to take away from this book? And what gives you the biggest hope? 
for our country? Well, I think those two questions are related. I think what I want people to take away from the book is first a sense of a better understanding of America's long history of of racism, white supremacy and anti-blackness and how it's related to where we are today. But second, I want them to take away from the book uh, the importance of this moment, the, the, the fierce urgency of now, Dr. King called it. I don't want people to sit back and think that things are going to get better on their own. I don't believe that. I think that if we do nothing, things will get worse. I want people to, to feel motivated, inspired, and educated, informed to, to, to be engaged and do something, to be engaged in, and, and not just to vote, which is the least I expect people to do uh, and to vote at every level of government, but to be engaged in a democracy and, and advocating for change, to be engaged by talking to uh, our friends and relatives and, and, and allies. Um, I, I don't think we can, we can simply expect that change is gonna happen unless we ourselves are the ones to make it happen. As June Jordan said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Another question, and I'm actually curious about this myself because I've had to sort of understand your role in our society, but the question is simple. What is the most challenging thing about your job? (laughs) And what is the most rewarding it's interesting to me because you seem to have a lot of jobs. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. I guess the most challenging thing is trying to figure out what my job is. Uh, <laughs> it's funny when you introduced me earlier in the, in the broadcast, I was thinking um, my job has changed several times, even since that, that bio was written for my last book. Um, you mentioned that I was a CNN, I'm a CNN political commentator. I'm no longer with CNN. Uh, in fact, I was just on MSNBC just okay. this week. Um, uh, you mentioned that I, I teach at Columbia uh, but I'm no longer at Columbia. Oh, I, boy. I'm most recently teaching at the city at City College. Um, and um, um, I don't know if you mentioned that I live in New York, but I live in Los Angeles now. I moved to Los Angeles in, in, uh, in January. So I feel like my job is always changing. Um, my life is always changing. Um, and it's an interesting question you asked because I haven't told anybody this. I'm kind of wary of saying this in public right now, but I am working on a new book right now. Um, that comes out later this year, which I haven't publicly stated, but it's a book called Quitting, mm. Leaving Your Job and Living Your Life with Freedom. Mm. Um, and um, it is all about that whole experience. You know, I, I left my last sort of full-time job back in the 90s, um, and I haven't had a, a, a full-time job since that time. I've been self-employed. So part of the, I think what's interesting about my job, what I like about my job is I don't have one job. I get to sort of create my life as I want to each day, and that each day is different. You know, some days I'm, I'm doing interviews. Some of the days I'm traveling to various cities uh, to speak. Uh, some days I'm writing. Uh, other days I'm, t- I'm on television. Uh, uh, some, I'm working on a, t- a couple of TV uh, and film projects here in Los Angeles. So I just like the freedom to be able to be involved in so many things that I think are important uh, work to do. So that's what I love about the work that I do. I think if I had all of those jobs, uh, the biggest challenge for me would be time management. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's a good not, point. Not playing one role off against the other. Well, you know, I'm too busy working on this thing over here <laughs> to focus on this thing that I'm on deadline for over here. That, right. that, that strikes me as the... Um, so, um, uh, another audience member wants to get back to some political advice on holding elected officials accountable. You mentioned earlier in our discussion that the majority of Americans want sensible gun le- legislation and want to keep Roe v. Wade intact. But if we don't get either of those things, what can someone do? to hold their elected official accountable? Well, you know, that's a good question. I, 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 <clears throat> I don't want to wonk out too much, <clears throat> but it reminds me of um, a conversation I first heard in my freshman year in college at Dartmouth in my first political science course, um, where we talked about uh, Anthony Downs information theory, information cost theory. Okay, this is way, way in the weeds here. Um, but I guess, I guess the point I'm, I'm making is that people say that they don't like Congress. Congress has never been popular in any poll I'm aware of going back to my, throughout my entire lifetime. But people like their individual member of Congress. But their individual member of Congress is contributing to, in many cases, the problems that they don't like about Congress. Um, 
And so part of what we need to do is to change our system and advocate for the change in system. But another part of what we need to do, and I actually wrote a chapter about this in the book about accountability, is to find ways to hold our own leaders accountable, even when they are part of our own team, our own tribe, our own party. Uh, and so what that means is, I'll give you an example. Barack Obama was president for eight years. I supported Barack Obama. I voted for him in both elections, but I, I went to law school with Barack Obama. I've known him for decades, but um, I still criticized him. Um, I didn't agree with everything he did. I didn't agree with uh, his, his decision to jettison the public option in, his, in, the, in the Affordable Care Act. I didn't agree with his drone policy. I didn't agree with his opposition to gay marriage when he was first elected until he uh, evolved on that. There are a lot of issues where I was critical of President Obama. And I feel like, and I was criticized for doing so, by the way, but I feel like if, if we expect any sort of change to happen, our job is not just to elect somebody and then be quiet. Our job is to hold those people accountable even after they're elected, um, whether they're on our side or not, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, Independent, or any other party. Um, and I think what happens oftentimes is that we give people a pass, a mulligan, and we say, oh, well, you know, he's on our team or she's on our side, so we don't really care if, if, if that person um, does something wrong. And I think we have to do a better job of holding our own side accountable. Um, and that means letting them know we dis when we disagree with them. Uh, and not necessarily saying, I'm never going to vote for you, I'm never going to vote for this party, but, but at least saying that this is wrong. I don't agree that he does this. I don't agree with my candidate does this. I think something happened. Uh, I'm still hearing you. I heard a little crack. Okay. I think my, I thought my microphone just we went got out. You. Um, okay. Since you brought up Barack Obama, I, I know that you worked in the Bill Clinton White House and that one of the efforts that you participated in was, was trying to lift the ban on gays in the military at the time. And you write about how that whole effort led us to don't ask, don't tell and it was kind of disappointing for you. And, and you learned something about yourself um, and, and about sort of how we are as, a, as political animals, like when, when, when we do this kind of work. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and I, I guess I want to ask you if that helped you understand what Barack Obama was going through when he finally became president. Absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, the reason why I feel like I can be critical of the Democratic Party is because I've been a Democrat my entire life. I've been a part of that party. I've worked for six political campaigns. I've worked in the White House. I was uh, on the committee, the credentials committee at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, so I've been a part of the institution itself. And because of my affiliation association with the party, I feel like I have the right to stand up and say that there are things that the party needs to do better. Um, and this all came about because of my experience working in the Clinton administration. I, I was a, a law student at Harvard when I first met Bill Clinton, when he came to campaign as a candidate and he was a governor of Arkansas. I liked what he had to say. He said he was going to lift the ban on gays in the military. I was inspired by that. I didn't expect that from a, a, a white Southern governor from Arkansas. Um, and uh, he seemed to have a fluidity and familiarity with black people and black culture that I hadn't expected either, but I appreciated it. And so I went to work for him. I quit my job. I left my job working for a law firm in San Francisco and drove halfway across the country to Little Rock, Arkansas uh, for very little pay to work on his campaign. And when he got elected, I ended up working in the White House. And one of the things I learned from that experience was that all of that sort of youthful naivete and idealism that I had was being challenged by the fact that we didn't actually accomplish some of the major things I wanted to accomplish. I remember, and I, I talk about this in the book, I remember sitting in a meeting with the president in the Oval Office, the first time any US president ever sat down with LGBTQ leaders in the Oval Office, and he sat down and he said in that meeting that he thought he'd be remembered in history for two things. One, for lifting the ban on gays in the military, and two, for health care reform. He did neither one of those things. Um, and the great irony is the person who did do that was my classmate, Barack Obama, when he was elected president. Um, so I think the cynicism comes in, understandably, when people feel like politicians get in office, and they don't do anything. And I think the answer is we have to make them do the things that they say they're going to do. Um, and I remember one other example for this. During that gaze in the military debacle, 
I remember walking through what was in the old executive office building next to the White House is now, I think, the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, and seeing in the basement of the, of the OELB, boxes and boxes stacked up, the people who were opposed to lifting the ban on gays in the military. And you can tell that they were postcards on the outside because they tell you what the, on the outside what the postcard says. Um, I don't remember seeing that from people who were in favor of lifting the ban on gays in the military. And part of that was because I think people expected that they just assumed that the person they elected was going to do the right thing. Um, and the real truth is that uh, we have to not just vote for people, but we have to actually hold them accountable once we vote for them. Um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, I think Thomas Jefferson said. And what happens oftentimes is that we think that a vote once every four years is enough. That's not enough. We have to be engaged beyond that. Keith Boykin, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure to be here. We encourage all of you to pick up a copy of Race Against Time at your local bookstore. You really got to read it. Um, like I said, so many passages that I would have had Keith Boykin read right here for us. But if you want to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit CommonwealthClub.org online. Uh, my name's Brian Watt. Thank you and take care.